Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Joanna Nuding. She is the host and producer of the Casually Baked podcast. She is a lifestyle cannabis guide. I think I got those words backwards, though. And she also has a family history of Alzheimer's and dementia. So she is very focused on brain health. And that is what we're talking about today. So thanks for joining me, Joanna. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, And yeah, you know, a lot of people, they get concerned about cannabis because they say, you know, it'll turn you into a zombie. But here I am using it as a wellness tool um, because I'm concerned about my brain health. So it's important for me for people to kind of understand a little bit more about the benefits of THC and CBD. and, um, And I'm excited to share my story with you. Well, why don't we start with your family history, because that's always a good place to start, and how you kind of got onto this path. Yes. So um, my grandmothers, as they were aging, I started to, you know, notice the the forgetfulness or, um, you know, the change in mood or attitude towards, um, you know, like my dad and things like that. And um, there was once where my grandmother, um, she, for, well, she didn't know who I was and it was really devastating for me. And, um, you know, towards the end of my bunny, I call her name was bunny. Um, at the end of bunny's life, I spent a couple of weeks taking care of her to, um, give my parents a break and, um, just having that really intimate time with someone who's suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's and, um, and fading in and out, you know, I just was like, okay, I live a really fun and exciting life and I don't want to forget it. And so is there something that I can do to feel empowered to move through life and not think that at the end that that's what's waiting for me? And so that's when I got really curious about brain health and what I can do as an individual to um, optimize my experience. That sounds like, sounds like me, because as you may remember from our previous conversation, that was months ago, (laughs) my maternal great grandmother, maternal grandmother, and my mom all had some form of cognitive impairment at the end of their lives. So yeah, I'm not going to be the fourth generation. Right. And, you know, the more I learned about, you know, the importance of what we're eating and, you know, for me, sleep, I was like, oh my God, yay. I love sleep. (laughs) Great. I get to do more of that. And I really am a princess with my sleep now. You know, I will not do things or I'm like, listen, I got to go home or y'all don't have to, you know, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. It's time for me to go to bed kind of a thing. (laughs) But I make sure I get my, you know, eight, eight and a half hours of sleep every night. Um, You know, I started buying cookbooks that were like, you know, what are smart brain foods and recipes and, you know, learning to slurp up a big tablespoon of olive oil first thing in the morning to feed my brain um, good fat and wake it up. You know, like all these little things were, um, were, you know, just simple little things that I know are making a huge long-term difference. Um, And I've been a cannabis consumer for over 20 years. Now I was not consuming cannabis for my brain health. In fact, when I started um, wondering about my brain health and and play, trying to play the long game, I sought out an epigenetic coach um, and did some genetic testing so that I could have an endocannabinoid report run because you know I was to the point where I'm like, okay, I love cannabis. Cannabis helps me with my anxiety. It helps me with pain relief and I'm willing to give it up if it's not good for my brain. And so that's a a big give up too. 
it it was a big give up. And I, you know, it's a, it's one of those things you can't unlearn either. You know, when you get data run about your, you know, mental, physical health or, you know, your gene mapping or whatever, it, it, this is a roadmap. And so, you know, you kind of, you got to go all in as far as I'm concerned, if you want to learn this information. And so I did a little bit of soul searching, but, you know, was willing to give it up. And um, I pulled up my report. Um, I used a peer on genomics. Uh, they're based out of North Carolina. They have um, offices in Austin, Texas. And um, I have a great coach. In fact, I'll share a link. That way you can share it with your guests if you want. Definitely. Um, but I was able to learn my endocannabinoid levels, um, how it affected my stress response, um, the CB1 and CB2 receptors in my body, and how it affected my cognitive fun function, and you know how my body metabolizes THC and CBD, and um, and then the mental health risk. You know, there there are genes associated with all of these things, and you know, technology exists now that we can continue to learn more and more. And I had this done two years ago, but I'm learn. I continue to learn more because as they learn more, they just upload the data into the system. And, you know, when I go in to look at my report, they're like, there's new data available. Do you want to refresh this report? So, you know, I find it very uh, helpful. Like I said, I'm a empowered doer. So, you know, you give me a roadmap, I can follow it. And I feel really confident that by strategically using THC and CBD, which are both neuroprotectants, um, along with um, lots of other things, um, you know, pain relief, uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-emetic, you know, an anti-analgesic, um, anti-anxiety, you know, there's all these benefits, but if you don't know how to use it exactly right, you could have a bad experience. That's why you want a cannabis lifestyle guide, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So how exactly do we go about, well, I'm probably putting the cart before the horse with that question. What, so we all have the, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, the connect, can, can I see it told you? The cannabinoid system. Yes. That is yes. part of our brain structure. Correct. Well, it's part of a, it's a system in our body, and okay. you know anybody that has autoimmune issues as well, um, you know cannabis CBD can be very beneficial because um, you know it's connected to our nervous system, and so we have CB one receptors that are mostly um, brain nervous system. And then the CB2 receptors are in our other organs, um, you know, reproductive organs and things like that. And so, um, you know, depending on how you use cannabis, whether or not it's in a tincture or a, a sublingual or a patch or, you know, somebody using it topically for localized pain relief or smoking it, you know, you're going to have a different effect. Um, and you know, there's different levels of bioavailability. And so, you know, it's, it's not like it used to be where it's just like, you know, puffing a joint there's, you know, how, if somebody needs high levels of THC, um, you know, somebody with cancer and that are in a lot of pain, a lot of times people use suppositories, um, mm. because they don't have to have so much of the psychoactivity because when you eat cannabis. And this is why a lot of people don't love edibles is it goes through two rounds of, um, metabolizing in your body once in your stomach and again, in your liver and that secondary metabolism or yeah, I guess that's the right word to use that's happening in your liver. It's making the, um, THC it's changing it up just a little bit and it becomes more psychoactive. So people, you know, they hit that like second wave of like, whoa, now I'm really high. Well, through a suppository, it's not going through your liver. So you're not going to get as high. So lots of tricks. If you have to, you know, 
use a lot of it. There's different ways to do that, that you can still be functional. But for, you know, somebody who's just using it supplementally, like I do for optimum health, um, you know, through my epigenetics, I, in this endocannabinoid report, I learned that I metabolize CBD really fast. So I have to take a lot more CBD than normal. I also learned that I have all of the genes for inflammation. And so I know that, and I know that I metabolize CBD as fast as anybody. It's like at the highest point on the chart. So that means I'm going to need more CBD anyway, but now I'm going to need like double that. And, you know, the THC, I don't metabolize it as fast. So, you know, it's just like having all of these tools um, can really help you dial in exactly how you can use whole plant medicine and not be on a bunch of pharmaceutical drugs. That's my, been my goal for a long time to go as natural as possible because my dad was on so many different, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. It was like every time he had a new issue, they'd give him a new drug, which would cause another side effects, which would give him a new drug. He was literally on like 25 or 26. They have no idea how those are interacting with each other. Yes. And just to me, it was just like, I call it pharmacological soup because it's just yeah. yuck. Like that's just, ew, no, it just, ew, it just doesn't. Well, and you know, in the, and here's the issue. If somebody does want to be more um, whole plant medicine based, and they are one of those people that is up to 20, 25 pharmaceutical drugs, the majority of those are going to, you know, they're having their own drug drug interaction, but now you have to also see what's the drug drug interaction, you know, with the cannabis and anything that says don't take if you, you know, with grapefruit, you know, a lot of the blood thinners and things like that. Well, CBD and THC can also interact in that regard. So if you're already somebody that's taking a lot of pharmaceuticals, you've made it pretty complicated for yourself and you need to talk to a cannabis nurse practitioner, somebody that you can hand over that list of drugs to and say, hey, I, I'm really wanting to shift my lifestyle and focus a lot more on eating, sleeping, finding whole plant options. I do want to incorporate cannabis if possible. And they can help you figure out how to navigate that. And, you know, because that's one of the things like I can give you great advice and I can, you know, give you can of confidence and help you to ask the right questions. But at the end of the day, you know, you involve your doctor in that conversation. And unfortunately, a lot of people live in places where their doctors don't know enough about cannabis to have an educated conversation. And so, you know, it's being able to reach out and have a telehealth call with a cannabis doctor or nurse practitioner that is well-versed in both worlds, you know, that's your best bet. And you can just do it just like we're talking right now. So why wouldn't you? No, oh, that's de totally. Now, do you have links for those to find those kind of people on your website? Um, I've done different shows and highlighted those um, different organizations, but I'd be happy to um, send you a couple of my favorites to share with your audience. Yeah, that would be great because my daughter has Crohn's disease, which is autoimmune. And she has to take a um, an immunosuppressant infusion. I think it's either once a month or every six weeks. They keep changing it, so I, I can't keep track. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. 30 now, so not not my problem. But with and, you know, with this whole COVID thing, she got her second COVID vaccine. And then the next day they gave her an immunosuppressant infusion. And it's like, mm, okay, my basic science from high school, which has been a few years, it you know, it makes me really concerned. We also have a friend whose daughter has Crohn's disease and she's gotten the booster already. She's also a teacher. So it's like, hmm. I would really like to see, like, could we, um, could we lower the use of the, you know, the intense drug if we mm -hmm. did other things, which obviously she would have to talk to these people that you were just talking about because that's not something we can, we can do on our own for yeah. sure. Yeah. You don't want to navigate that on your own. 
However, um, you know, going into a doctor's appointment, having the research, having a couple of those white papers already that you've looked at and being able to go in with questions. Um, and again, I, I will say I do know several people firsthand that have Crohn's disease and manage it with cannabis and it helps them tremendously. So I definitely would ask, you know, getting curious and finding out ways to, um, to just shift your lifestyle to one that is certainly a lot more natural and organic and, um, and, you know, the pharmaceutical industry hasn't done any favors for anybody that I know. So I'm like, how can I cut them out of my life until, unless it's something that is absolutely necessary. Cause like I said today, you know, I'm talking about a wellness lifestyle. I don't have comorbidities. So, you know, I get that pharmaceuticals are great for other people, but you know, for like low level anxiety or OCD or something like that. No, I'm going the natural route. And that's how I've treated it for the last 20 something years. And if you can start a whole plant way and just kind of ride that wave, I'm doing it gracefully. I'm 45 so far, so good. Um, and you know, my parents, when they always say, join it's hell getting old, I'm like, yeah, but I watched what you did. I saw your lifestyle and I'm doing it differently. So my lifestyle is an experiment. So we'll see how it goes. We won't know until it's over, will we? <laughs> <laughs> and is it so ever I'm, really over, Jen? I have my opinions on that one. I'm <laughs> I'm very spiritual. I'm not religious. So I, I feel like our energy or, you know, the soul, if you want to call it that, our energy goes out into the universe and becomes part of the greater energy of the world. And you may or may not yeah. be it's aware of energy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm creative. And when you're doing something and all of a sudden, you know, you're just like, you know, T-boned with an idea. It's like that idea came from somewhere. And, you know, I know some people will think it's one thing or another, and that's all fine. I have, you know, I have my opinions and I don't, I don't share them very often because I know they're a little odd for some people, but that's okay. But the I question think that's I was, what makes it fun. That's true. Depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> But I've always like, well, there's two things I've said a lot. I, one, I think natural is better. I, I know people that have done like the yoga and the vegan and the, I can't do vegan. I'm sorry, but I try, you know, I try to eat as healthy as possible. And I, over the last decade, I've really kind of lost a lot of the taste for beef, which is good. And I could do a lot more vegetarian meals than I used to before. I always felt like I was missing something and now I don't feel that way, but I like a lot of variety. So that's kind of one of my challenges. But, and I also think that mo- I don't think modern life is healthy for us. I really don't with the noise and the distractions and the stresses and the pollution. And, you know, just I really think it's not great. Well, I, you know, I think there's plenty of pollution on social media. There's, you know, all kinds of pollution. So for me, it's cutting all of that stuff out. And, uh, you know, choosing my inputs very carefully, you know, who and what am I listening to? Even my music. I listen to um, a lot of binaural beats or classical music or, you know, morning jazz. Like I just I try to keep this like, you know, chill, mellow vibe. Um, And, you know, I eat what I want. I don't. I, you know, I don't want a bunch of sugar. I don't drink sodas. I don't even, you know, if I'm going to drink a kombucha, there's like two of them that I will drink that have barely any, you know, less than two or three grams of sugar in them. The rest of them, it's like 15 or 18 grams of sugar. And I get sure this is healthy for my gut, but you're also not thinking about brain health and like the sugar thing for me is like, one of the biggest and most important things for me to control my sugar, my sleep. And, um, and again, you know, for me, it's the CBD and THC and I take my CBD in, um, in a pill format and I take it multiple times a day. I take at least 90 milligrams of CBD a day at this point. Um, and have actually since 
because the me learning about the how fast I metabolize CBD, that was a recent learning for me. That's new information that was just refreshed. So I've actually started supplementing a little more since I've learned that information. But as far as I'm concerned, um, the ultimately me, ultimately the most important thing is for us to really enjoy what we're doing and enjoy life and laugh and be happy and be creative and be playful. You know, stress is the killer. Definitely. <laughs> it's, so. I always say like stress is like poison. It's terrible for us. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful that I've worked from home for 16, almost 17 years. You know, not that life is stress free, but sometimes when I feel myself getting frazzled and stressed, I I take a big step back because it's like I'm like 90 percent in charge of what it's going on. So if I'm feeling stressed, I need to change something. So that that's mm-hmm. that's a very big blessing. But the question I was going to ask earlier that I said that was I was putting the cart before the horse is the one advice that I see all the time for brain health is like, if you're worried about Alzheimer's or you're worried about your brain health and you're still smoking, the best thing you can do right now is quit. So I'm assuming you don't smoke it. Um, I don't smoke cigarettes. I don't smoke anything like that. I smoke cannabis. Um, you cannabis can't be put in that same category. Um, and I haven't, as far as smoking cannabis, I have not seen that that poses any brain health risk. Yeah. So when you when you say that, are you talking about just inhaling anything or was it inhaling c- cannabis specifically that you no, had they, heard? They just talk about if you're smoking, quit. So I equate that to inhaling anything, but you're saying that it's different. And I know there's chemicals and garbage and horrible, mm-hmm. horrible things in cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Now, and I also don't vape. Okay. Now, you know, there are, you know, if anything, if you're a vapor and you're vaping propylene glycol, if that's one of the ingredients, stop. Just stop doing that. It's terrible for you. Um, like that's the stuff um, that comes out of those big smoke clouds at a, at the old, you know, Motley Crue concert. Um, <laughs> you know, that stuff was not meant to go into your lungs. And we did a, I did a show with my best friend who's a PhD formulation scientist who worked in the vaping world in the EU and the UK and came to the United States and was horrified with the regulations that did not exist around vaping. So I've done some deep dives on that and I'm just not a vapor. But as far as cannabis flower or, um, or concentrate that is, you know, live resin. I, that's what I do. And I, I stand by it. I'm not, I'm not concerned about something like that at all. Um, I was telling you before the show, um, you know, in 2006, the Scripps Research Foundation um, in California, I don't want to get this wrong, so I'm just going to read it. They reported findings that THC actually inhibits the enzyme responsible for beta amyloid protein from clumping together into what we know as plaques um, between the nerve cells. So that's one of the main causes of Alzheimer's, um, among other things. And those findings were supported by subsequent studies. And there was also, you know, one in 2014 that was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. So, you know, if somebody's like, yeah, 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 girl, you and your your cannabis, like there's actual a lot of research for a lot of years that's been done on this. And um, they proved that the THC was more effective than some of the Alzheimer's drugs. Um, I don't know. Donna, Donna Pazette. Oh, Denazepil. That one and Tacrin are the two that were listed in this study. I, you know, I don't know anything about the drugs. I knew you probably had a better idea on that stuff than me. My mom was on the Denazepil, which is the only reason I could pronounce it. I see. That's why I was like, I don't know if you probably did. Well, I don't know why they can't give these drugs names that are pronounceable. It's just bizarre. Like the new. Alzheimer's drug is aducanumab. I can't even say it. It's like whatever. Like just give yeah, it a better if I can't name. pronounce it. I'm not taking it. Yeah, it's crazy. But 
my understanding is, and of course, you know, the neuro neurologist says different, which they should know, but I've talked to enough people that basically say the, what these Alzheimer's drugs do is it helps, it helps basically the neurons to fire around the plaques. You know, it it kind of gives you some new pathways and some new, you know, new ways to, for the neurons to communicate, but it's just temporary. Right. It's a band-aid. Yeah. Because I'm like, well, then, but if the plaques weren't forming, like if we were consuming THC and CBD in a medicinal format and it's going to keep the plaques from forming, then we don't have to, we can maintain healthy neural pathways. Definitely. And so these drugs, they put the people on like my, I don't know how long my mom was probably on hers for at least 10 years close to 10 years would be my guess. And they say it only works for like the first, you know, five years best. It's kind of the equivalent of, I didn't get a good night's sleep. So I'm going to have extra caffeine today, which uh, caffeine kind of runs through my veins. So that never helps me, but (laughs) that's irrelevant. You know, so it's, but well, actually maybe it's not irrelevant. It's, it's kind of similar. It's like, it doesn't, it only helps a tiny bit and it's temporary, but you know, if you can kind of plateau somebody, you know, for a couple of years, you know, the longer you avoid the later stages, the better, which is a really good reason to do all these things, you know, before we find out that we've got this disease or, you know, like I'm 55. If I put it out 10 years, then like my mom died at 77. Maybe I wouldn't have the later stages till I was in my 90s. Maybe or I won't never get to my at 90s. all. Or yeah. maybe you wouldn't get it at all. Well, I, I sleep- found out I have two of the three genes. Yikes. <laughs> so for me, I'm like, take care of your shit, Joanna. Yeah. Definitely you know? plan ahead. And But I feel so confident that there's evidence that if we change our behaviors, if we change our diet, and it takes discipline. It's not easy to make the good micro choices that make up the macro of our lives, but choosing the salad versus the carnitas tacos that I would much rather eat. (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) You know, like those little things, but still giving myself the carnitas tacos every now and again, you know, it's, but I'm not, in my line of thinking, it's not, I'm not putting this off 10 years or 20 years. I'm not getting it, period. That's been my goal. Like I said at the start, I will not be the fourth generation. And one of the reasons I keep doing this podcast, even though my mom is gone, is I keep still keep learning great things from guests. So one, learning new things is always beneficial for our brains. And, yeah. you know, if it just helps me, then okay, whatever, I'll just keep doing it, which sounds selfish, but I'm, it gives me confidence that other people learn things. So you would suggest that people get the, okay, so it's the epigenetic testing, which tests, my tongue's not working right, tests your, your CBD levels in your system. It, it will get, it will um, give you an endocannabinoid report. That's the word I was looking for. So somebody, if somebody has done a 23andMe genetics test or something like that, you can take those results and um, David Krantz is my epigenetic coach. And, you know, for me, it's not just getting the test. It's having somebody that can walk you through the results and talk you through, um, you know, types of supplements that might be beneficial for you based on your genes. Um, for me, the other thing that I loved about it was, you know, if you, these are the best fruits and vegetables and nuts and milks and, you know, all the different things. So basically now I have my grocery list. These are the thing, these are the types of cooking oils I use now. These are the ones I throw away because they're not good for me. And, you know, I started cooking a lot more at home so that I could be in control of the types of oils that I use. And, um, you know, so it's all of those little things that I learned through this testing and, you know, David Krantz specifically um, for Apiron, he developed, he's been the one that's developed the endocannabinoid panel 
and report because he's a, a cannabis user and he, you know, he was curious about it. He was a creative and um, and so he specifically is doing it. I know there's other companies now that do it um, as well, but um, the Appear on Genomics, it's a company that's got a really great reputation. They work with, you know, Olympic athletes, C-suite executives, people that are just trying to optimize performance. And so, you know, it's a great group of people. And like I said, I, um, I appreciated having that coaching piece because this is going to look like a foreign language to a lot of people. And especially when they're like, I didn't even know I had an endocannabinoid system. You know, I learned bodies- about that like two and a half years ago. I didn't know about it either until I met a gal whose mom had Alzheimer's and she had always been a, a cannabis user and her mom fell. And so then was afraid to get out of bed. I will link this episode in the show notes. So you guys can go back and listen to it. If you haven't heard it, she was so much fun, but one day she just, her mom woke up and was like, I just want a joint. So they shared a joint. Her mom got out of bed without any fear of falling or any help. They watched a movie together, which, you know, most of the time they can't track long enough to follow the plot of a movie. I mean, there's some movies I can't follow the plot on and my brain is fine. And she just, that was the trigger. And so she started doing a lot of this same research and she's got like a three inch binder of all of the, I'm going to forget the word, but the, like the outcomes, like the, um, What is that word? I I thought my brain was doing good. (laughs) The summary, basically. I know that's not the actual word they use, but the summary of the of the research and the testing and everything. And she was she was just huge on like this is what people need to be doing. So she was kind of like you, but I don't think she took it as far as you've done, which is why I wanted to talk to you. Plus, you know, I'm just curious. That's yeah. I, I like learning new things and and you know, and like if I can you know, convince the daughter, maybe she should check into it and say, you know, Hey, there's a, there might be an option other than going to the doctors, you know, the, basically the infusion clinic once a month for a couple hours and getting this, you know, this pharmaceutical pumped into your system, but here's all the things you're going to have to do. Do you want to do that? She might choose not to. So what kind of to have options, you know, it's good to have options. Definitely. Cause I, it's a little scary. She was, she had just graduated from college. So she was 23 when she was diagnosed. So God Lord, that means she's had it for seven years. You know, if she lives as long as her grandma, it's a long time to have to do that kind of drug. Yeah. And they cha- had to change the medication because the, the first one they put her on was affecting her liver, which we all know is bad. You know, so you kind of kind of wonder like, is, yeah. Is the stuff that she's taking, is it going to be safe to take for, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 years or more? Because she could live longer than Mm -hmm. my paternal grandmother did, which that's almost a frightening thought, too. (laughs) Well, you know, one thing that I will say about our endocannabinoid system. So the phytocannabinoids in cannabis, they're plant-based cannabinoids. They are like mirror images, doppelgangers of the endocannabinoids that our body produces. So as we age, our body starts producing less of these cannabinoids. And so as we age, it becomes even more important to supplement those, you know, just like as someone is going through menopause and, you know, their hormone levels are fluctuating and changing the same thing as we happens with our endocannabinoids. And so, you know, just learning about that alone, whether or not you're concerned about brain health or not, aging gracefully, like CBD fights free radicals in the body. And, and it's important to supplement like all of my parents, friends, and, you know, anybody that's aging, all of the old people in my life, I try to get them to consider at least a CBD supplement. But again, you always have to say what's, you have to look into the drug drug interactions because a lot of them are taking a lot of pharmaceuticals. So, you know, your daughter 
being able to get curious about this now, she could save herself a shit ton of time with the American healthcare system (laughs) and, you know, shelling out so much money to the pharmaceutical companies for the rest of her life. Yeah, for real. That's a, that's a motivation right there. So I was, I'm going to ask you this really random question. (laughs) You may not have the answer and I'm going back to like, I'm thinking, I don't know if you want to say ancient times, but pre-industrial living times or whatever we are living in now. Does the cannabis plant pretty much, I know like in there's parts of our country where it grows wild. There's, There's a family story of this couple that picked a bunch of wild leaves and flowers and stuff. And part of the bouquet they made had had the cannabis plant in it because <laughs> they didn't know any different. Um, but does it in general grow fairly wild, like globally, or is it like, I know it pretty much likes warm and damp weather, doesn't it? Like not necessarily tropical, but well, I mean, it loves to have hot days and cool, breezy nights. Um, but, you know, cannabis for tens of thousands of years grew. Now, you know, have I ever just been out in the wild and, and saw <laughs> cannabis growing? No, but it does grow like a weed. I mean, when they <laughs> say that really? you, you can grow it, if, you know, just put it in the ground and the darn thing will grow. Now, Back in the beginning, you wouldn't have found THC levels in cannabis like you do now. There was more a natural balance between the CBD or THC. But as, you know, farmers and man gets their hands on it and starts (laughs) tinkering with it. And it's like, oh, you know, you start breeding stuff. They started breeding up the THC and breeding out the CBD. So. Now that we're in a legal market and there's all different kinds of things that we know now, even though we don't have federal legalization, we have enough research to know what a bunch of these different cannabinoids and terpenes do. And so you've got a lot of farmers and genetics folks getting really creative and creating um very specialized types of cannabis flower. So you can have stuff that's high CBD, but still has some THC in it or stuff that's one-to-one or whatever. So I don't think anymore you would find, you know, find it growing out in the wild. It might be that somebody, um, you know, tossed some seeds out. Now you toss some seeds out and, you know, deer eats them up, poops them out somewhere. You might have some some cannabis on that hike you go on, but you know, I don't think that's normal anymore. Well, the reason I asked is because you said, you know, we have the, I'm going to screw the word up, the, the in, endo. You can call it the ECS. Of, that also. That would work. I can remember that. See, it's Friday afternoon. I had a great bike ride this morning. <laughs> I have 50 things on my brain. So pronouncing stuff properly is obviously not prioritized today. <laughs> And that exercise, that's also super important for our brains. Yeah. It's amazing. Just to sidestep slightly. I get some of the best creative ideas. There was one day, I don't think I've told this story on the podcast recently or ever. I was riding by myself and it was like popcorn popping in my head of ideas. And if I finally got to the point where I'm like, I am not going to be able to remember all of these things. So I just like, at the, this point I was living, I had to go up an 11% grade hill to get home. So that was always fun. Like the hardest part of the ride was getting home. And so I just like, just stepped on it and rode as hard and as fast as I could so that I, my brain did not have enough oxygen to think about creative stuff. And I got home, it was like, <laughs> and I'm like scribbling stuff on paper. My husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I had all these really good ideas. I got to write them down. <laughs> it's just, yeah. like, it was the weirdest experience because it's like, you know, I get creative ideas all the time and sometimes they get kind of filed away in the dark recesses and then they pop out. But it was like, it was the weirdest. I don't know if it was just a combination of like the right temperature and amount of sunlight and exercise. And endorphins. And- yeah, you were, you had it all going on. I it have- was crazy. I, you know, try to get out that note feature, the voice memo feature on my phone now. And, um, 
But it's weird when you're trying to dictate your thoughts back as you're having them. They're not coming out as smooth as as you're feeling them. So, um, but I writing want- that shit down is important. Well, it's just, it's another way of helping your brain remember, especially when you had like, I mean, literally it was like, I think it was like six ideas before I was like, I'm either going to have to stop writing and write, you know, dictate it all on my phone and, or I'm just going to have to like make my brain stop, stop being creative so I can get home and write down the good stuff that already happened, which is the choice I took. Cause like once you get out there writing, you just don't want to stop until you absolutely have to stop. So, but the reason I asked about the wild growing plant is I'm thinking back to like the hunter gathering days, which I was, I can't even think about how far back that is, but I'm just kind of wondering if, if the plant was part of like an ancient diet. And I mean, obviously they didn't live as long as we do now. So it's kind of hard to know if, you know, they were eating the plant and that helped them and they died at 40. So they didn't have time to get Alzheimer's. It just kind of, that's, that's the kind of weird stuff I think about. Well, but it is, I mean, it was, Cannabis is listed in the oldest um, Chinese medical text. I don't remember what the name of the Chinese dynasty is, but whatever that medical text is, cannabis is in it. That's interesting. It didn't become something that was frowned upon or, I mean, it was used in this country as medicine, you know, before prohibition. So, you know, it wasn't until... um, you know, Harry Anslinger, you know, late twenties, early thirties. I I'm, didn't pay close enough attention in history class, but you know, this kind of stuff was a disinformation campaign and, okay. and prohibition, these days. yes. And prohibition did a real number on baby boomers. And then the war on drugs campaign you know, Nancy Reagan's just say no, like Gen Xers like me, hell, they're people going to school, narking on their parents. So, <laughs> you know, we're asking two completely brainwashed generations to now look at something that was demonized and now say, this is a medical miracle. It is a little hard to wrap your head around. I was I was in high school with the just say no on drugs. So, you know, and ah, this is back. I graduated from high school in 84. So we still had the smoking sections in high school, but we also had the narcs to keep you on campus and to keep you smoking in the spot you're supposed to, but only smoke cigarettes and only if you're 18 and all that. Ah, just insane. Mm-hmm. And I tried cigarettes when I was like 13. They were gross. So I'm not like, I'm glad to know that I wouldn't have to smoke this stuff to get the benefits because that's not a habit I'm going to pick up. I really like my lungs the way they are. (laughs) But I'm also interested that smoking cannabis is not as bad for you as smoking cigarettes. Oh, of course not. No, absolutely. And let me also say that the cannabis industry has made huge. advances in the products, especially out here in California where we've been at it for longer. So, you know, I adopted more of a California sober lifestyle because again, brain health, not drinking as much alcohol. And there are cannabis beverages now on the market that you can Mm. get um, something that is like a non-alcoholic beer. You know, it's a hops water but it's got 10 milligrams of THC in it or five milligrams of THC, five milligrams of CBD and no sugar. And I can drink it and it can give me that satiation of having a beer with my friends, but I'm drinking, uh, you know, hi-fi hops by Lagunitas and they're drinking something else from Lagunitas that's got booze in it, you know, Um, or alcohol in it. And, you know, there's seltzer, um, you know, cans now that you can, you know, everybody's into uh, what's the alcohol version, like those little vodka drinks that everybody's drinking now in a can. Now you can have a, (laughs) a cannabis beverage in a can that it has that same onset effect that, you know, somebody drinking their vodka soda and 
within an hour and a half that can say that feeling can go away and you can feel comfortable getting in your car and driving home. So, you know, you don't have to worry about, well, if I don't want to smoke, I have to have an edible. And then that means I'm on a five hour ride. It doesn't have to be that anymore. So, you know, if someone lives in a cannabis legal state, they should go into a dispensary, check it out, you know, check out my podcast, Casually Baked. I've got new episodes out you know, every week. And we talk about all the new stuff that's happening and the the changes in the cannabis culture and a highly responsible lifestyle. So if, you know, you've demonized cannabis, it's time to take another look at it because it's got a lot to offer now. And if you live in a state that doesn't have legal cannabis, then this should be motivation for you to rattle some cages and and get that movement going. Yeah, the, to write the different disinformation campaign to fix that. I find it interesting that you said Lagunitas makes a cannabis-based drink because that's one of my husband's favorite beers and he's really trying to break the beer habit. So I might be able to get him to shift over. However, he is on blood thinners. So I think we have to be careful there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And that is something that you could talk to that nurse practitioner, cannabis nurse practitioner about. And, you know, and I also think it very well could be the, um, the dosage. It could be, you know what, if you want to have a couple of hi-fi hops, it's not going to do anything to you. Now, don't take 100 milligrams of THC because that, you know, so you might learn that it's not a very big deal, but they're going to want to know the dose, how often you take it, and then they'll give you, a, you know, an insightful recommendation. Which is always nice to have. Well, I have to tell you, I had shingles all last summer. And I went to our local dispensary. I think I went on a Monday. Yes, I did go on a Monday. The place was hopping. And they're like, oh, no, this is quiet. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like a line out the door. And, you know, I'm in like white suburbia out here. And the clientele was pretty much everything from what you might, you know, uh, what's the stereotype? The stereotype. Yeah, yeah, you might stereotypically think of. And there was a bunch of white middle-aged ladies in there like myself, but I used a, um, it was a topical product for the, um, shingles, the pain, which was, I, I have a pretty high pain threshold and I am waiting for the ability to get the shingles vaccine because I am never doing that again. That was horrible. Yeah. And I- it was, it was great stuff, but our local, so I want, I, this is kind of, um, this is, you were talking about rattling cages to make it recreationally legal. Our local cannabis dispensary pays above minimum wage and benefits for basically a retail type job. And I'm making air quotes because they are educated. And, They're and bud talking, tenders. Yes, bud tenders, which I was laughing because my husband loves peanut butter. And while I was there waiting in line, I, I spotted a display of peanut bud-er. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, cannabis infused peanut butter. That's kind of cool. <laughs> but <laughs> I can get have, anything. I, I, I need to go back because I'm, I'm a little more curious now, but I don't generally drink because as I've told people, I have like a wicked sweet tooth, although Neuro Reserve has fixed that, thankfully. But it puts people off because they're like, oh, I don't know what to do with her. She drinks this iced tea stuff. I'm like, ah, she's so fussy about her tea. And it's like, yeah, I am. I'll bring it myself. Thank you. No problem. It's like, I don't care. You guys want to drink? It's fine. People get loud and obnoxious. I don't like that. But, you know, I don't judge. Right. But people judge me because I'm like, I'm over here sipping tea like an old lady. Yes. So we, were, we had dinner with friends and at one point, my husband had told me prior to the dinner with friends recently, he says, you know, if you let people know that you like the edibles, that would probably help people stop judging you for not drinking. <clears throat> so our friends are all drink. My husband and the two friends are drinking wine. And they've got like this really rich red wine, which gives me like instantaneous heartburn. One of the reasons I don't drink wine. And they were talking about how it went very good with chocolate and they had special chocolates. And I'm like, wait, they make chocolate flavored ones. I'll take one. 
like no hesitations and he like presented it all funny and it was just like it was and it was tasting good so i gotta go over there and get some <laughs> oh yeah and you know but to your shingles if you i don't know what you were taking but cbd is in very important for stuff like that like you know just the um the inflammation relief also you know the pain and um gosh there's in taking it internally i think a lot of people they're like oh cbd they put it on their skin and there's so much power by letting it work inside your system so not that you're ever going to have that again, Mm-mm. but if anyone else <laughs> has shingles and, you know, I, cause I'd recently had a call, a friend of mine, um, her wife has an autoimmune disease and she had gotten shingles and is so uncomfortable that just the fan blowing in their room was killing her. She like, the sheets couldn't touch her, like yep. the clothes couldn't touch her. And so we were talking about what were the options and ingesting CBD, not just putting it on your skin is, um, is really important. I did that when we were, we were on a three week road trip. That's how I remember I went on a Monday cause we left Tuesday. When I got home, they were out of the one-to-one. It's like a it's a really oily cream. It's like Vaseline, but like on steroids. Like my shingles was on my upper ribs. So wearing a bra was not fun, uh, but not wearing a bra wasn't funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one bra that's like permanently stained from this, this topical ointment. So they only had a, um, so it was a hundred milligrams of THC and CBD. So one to one. And they only had like a roll on product, which was way less greasy, but it was 50 milligrams. So he said, take the tincture with it. And then I also had gummies. So one night I did all of them and oh, good. <laughs> fell asleep <Yeah>. very well. <laughs> when the room spun, I was like, oops, I probably shouldn't have done so much. <laughs> you, wasn't did, you sleep well? did you sleep well? Good. Yep. Yeah. Cause but, that's the thing. I'm like, the THC is so helpful for the pain. You know, of course, it's all about the dose. If you take a little too much, it can amplify the pain. And so, you know, there's some experimentation to find your sweet spot and what works for you. And, you know, if people can just go in knowing that, like this isn't, I'm not going to get it right the first time, then it's it's a little easier of an experience. But, um, But bless you, I'm glad you're feeling better now. Yeah. Right at the beginning of the disease, I had brain fog so bad. I, and I knew I'm like, I know it's the disease. I know it's the shingles, but it literally, it was like, I thought I had like instantaneous dementia because I'd wander into a room and kind of look around confused. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know where I was, even though it's my house, forget why I walked into the room Mm -hmm. and then just kind of wander around. Like, like I had no brain function. It was so freaky because that's how my mom was at the end. And it was like, this is really scary because, you know, we get sick and we don't feel great. We sleep a little, you know, we sleep more than normal or whatever, you know, we just don't have energy, but that was scary. And, that, and you know, and, and there, the doctor gave me 800 milligrams of Motrin, which doesn't do anything for nerve pain. And then when I complained after having it for almost three months, I'm like the daily discomfort and the lack of ability to like actually work for more than a couple of hours. This is a problem. It's affecting my mental health. It's, you know, it's preventing me from working and exercising. There's got to be something that we can do. And I was thinking in the back of my head, you're curing these idiots that have not done the vaccine for COVID and they're getting sick and you're you're fixing them. Got to be something you can do for me, right? Like I am proactive about my health. I do my due diligence. Like, please, please figure out something, right? No, that's when she recommended the gabapentin, which is a narcotic. I'm like, yeah, no, that I should have taken that in July, not in September. Like, never mind. I'll figure it out myself. <laughs> so. I, I just had the author of a, a new book that's out called How to Avoid Being a Victim of the American Healthcare System um, by uh, David Wilcox. He's a doctorate prepared nurse. And I highly recommend anyone, you can listen to that podcast, but also just getting that book. It is such a great resource manual for dealing with doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, and, and just 
understanding what the hell is actually going on in the healthcare system. Um, because, you know, like David said, as Americans, we're apathetic to it until we're in it. And then yeah. that's too late. So how not to be a victim of the American health care system. OK, definitely get and get that on my on my reading list. Yeah, because, you know, it's and that was the worst thing with the shingles is because all the covid outbreaks they had in the summer of 2021. I had to do all my appointments either virtually or via messaging. I mean, they basically diagnosed me over with pictures through messaging, which, OK, fine. They still made me go to the freaking hospital parking lot and get a COVID test because they insisted and didn't understand that I don't go anywhere and I was vaccinated. And if I had gotten COVID, I would nuke this town because I would have been so upset. <laughs> but I did it because I'm like, as soon as I say there's no way in hell that I have COVID, that will be the problem. And yeah. it wasn't the problem. I was negative. So shocker. But, you know, it's just we have to be more educated and curious about our own health and well-being so that we can avoid, you know, dementias and Alzheimer's because doctors don't get any training on that. I mean, even the neurologist, sometimes I didn't think she really understood Alzheimer's as well as I did, which is really saying something because I barely made it out of college. So, you know, it's and I majored in business, not science or any of that stuff. And well, and just taking the role as a partner in our healthcare instead of just being the person that's listening to somebody in the white coat, knowing yep. that I have to be an expert on my body and knowing what's happening to my body and and being able to communicate that and ask the right questions. And, you know, there's it's uh, it's helpful to have an advocate. Um, you know, one of the things David said was if you don't have a friend that's a nurse find a friend that's a nurse. It's important to have somebody to ask questions to, to, you know, bounce things off of before you get in there. Cause a lot of people, for whatever reason, they clam up around the doctor and they just do what they're told or they get interrupted by the doctor and they don't speak up or, you know, they don't share, continue sharing that list of prescription drugs. And then all of a sudden, they're given something that they shouldn't be given. And then they have a whole other problem on their hands, but they're having to pay for it. Yeah. So, you know, it's just helpful to, you know, get loud. It's your body. It's your health. You know, talk about it and be an active participant in the solution finding. Well, I did do an episode on healthcare advocacy on its, its actual tips and advice from a pediatric pharmacist who works in doctor's office. She went through cancer treatment in her thirties, breast cancer. And that's when she learned the system is really not great. And so she educates people on how to be, how to appropriately advocate for yourself. Cause you know, I'm sure your mom, my mom, you know, they taught us to be polite and we have to respect people that have more education and should know more about certain things than we do. And that's when you kind of like, I always got a little timid around doctors, even though as a younger adult, like really younger adult, I would just get angry and yell, which is not useful. And so now I, I kind of err on the opposite side because, you know, yelling does not get you anywhere. So maybe being polite and, and respectful should, but that doesn't always work either. So it's definitely worth checking that episode out if you haven't heard it. And I think this is great that you, you've given us a roadmap and a better understanding of how we can use a natural product. I don't want to say product because that's not natural, but a natural plant to perhaps, you know, help our health and wellness and aging well yeah. plan because. And, and mitigate. It can, you know, the effects of, like I said, you know, the plaques even forming, like stop it before it happens. Don't wait till it gets here and then try to put a Band-Aid on it. Yeah, they can't. They haven't figured out how to clear them out. So, yeah, let's do what we can to prevent them from forming. And we don't have to smoke it. You don't have to get all foggy and goofy. Right. But, I, you know, most of my friends like to drink a lot of wine. So <laughs> I don't see that they, they would have a problem with that. We just have to get past that, yeah. you know, ooh, drugs you don't bad. Want, that's right. And if you don't want to be altered, you don't have to be. And if you don't know what that roadmap could look like for you, 
well, I've built one for myself and I'm happy to help other people. That's the fun part about being a cannabis lifestyle guide, being able to, you know, hold somebody's hand through this and, and help them figure out the best solutions that fit into their exact lifestyle. You know, you, there's no such thing as one size fits all you're a precious snowflake and, <laughs> and that, and that I love it and I'll, we'll, we'll figure it out together. That sounds awesome. Well, that sounds like a great place to end. So I can't remember how long we've been talking now. It's probably an extra long episode this time, <laughs> which is fine. But definitely check out Joe's podcast, Casually Baked. I'm sure you can find it wherever you're listening to this one. And thank you very much. Joe and I are almost in the same area. We're not too far apart anymore. So maybe one of these days we'll actually get to see each other in person. Yes, that will be nice. Come, you can come visit me in wine and weed country, and then I'll head over to the lake sometime to see you. Definitely. And it's a very active, um, it's, a, it's an active recreational community. So it'll be interesting to see what I, I learn about the people as we've lived there longer. When we're recording this, I haven't quite moved yet, but when it comes out, I will be living there. So it should be, should be interesting to, to hear this back in a couple of months. So. Thank well, you good so luck. much. Good luck on your move. Good luck. I know it's, be it's going to be stressful. CBD and THC will be your friends. <laughs> I will go to <laughs> Coco County Farms. That's our local, our local dispensary and talk to them. There you go. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.